Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming along. Um, I, as you can tell from the title of my talk, um, this is one that has been one of the most enjoyable pieces of research for a talk that I've had to do. I've quite enjoyed preparing for this one. I get to talk about one of my non-work obsessions and then hopefully say something that's useful as well as just interesting about my cats. Um, but before I get to the cats, a little bit about me. So um, I'm uh, d uh, Director of Delivery for uh, the Financial Times. I work with enabling teams, so engineering enablement. Um, and so with my background as a developer, I now work with these teams whose interest is in development. They are there to help engineers. And so it's through that lens that I've written, written this talk. Um, one of the things we do at the FT to um, help our engineers is to run internal tech, tech conferences. And that's something I co-wrote a book with Matthew Skelton, who, is, who wrote the much more famous and successful book, <laughs> Team Topologies. Um, but I had the honor of being able to work with him on, on this book. So it'll feature a little bit during this talk, but it's not about that book. And it's not about in tech talk, um, conferences. So, um, like many people, I bought a cat during lockdown. He is my obsession. Um, so I'm going to introduce you to him and four other cats. And we are going to look at their working environment, at what helps them in that work environment, and what makes life a little bit hard for them. I'm going to do that using these four lenses. Um, now, Kubert explained this much better than me this morning. But the, the success that people can achieve, what they can hope to accomplish, the creativity that they're able to use is often constrained by whatever constraints they are within. That will limit what people can achieve. So what we don't want to do is create an environment that enables people, that empowers people. And these are aspects that um, I felt was included in that. And ultimately, as an agilist, it comes to this agile principle, which is... Uh, whatever number it is, number five in the Agile Manifesto. So the first cat we're going to meet is Peanut. So Peanut is an indoor cat. And as you can see, he's absolutely beautiful. He's adorable. He is very good at posing handsomely. He wins lots of awards for his real fluffiness. But as an indoor cat, um, his house is his entire world and he walks inside that house. He, he walks inside those rooms, the same rooms, every day, and he has no reason to think that there's anywhere else to go. The outside world, through windows, is just a television. That's not real. That's some other thing. It feels distant to him. So um, <coughs> he relies on his human so apologies. I'm having to read these quite a lot. Last time I gave this talk, it was over VC. <laughs> And you have your script right there. I haven't memorized this very well. But um, he relies as well as an indoor cat on his humans to, to bring his food and his enjoyment, his, his enjoyment. So he's very dependent on, on other things, controlling his environment. So life as an engineer for Peanut, I could imagine that. It might be um, a very traditional and hierarchical environment. It might be um, one of those tight constraints. If you were in Liz Keogh's talks, it might be those governing constraints um, which would control his environment. So they maybe they're imp important in that environment for safety and security. And so in that environment, um, he may find that he doesn't get to make a lot of decisions, but not only that, other people are making decisions for him that he doesn't even know about. So he doesn't know what decisions are being made on his behalf. His skills are probably very niche. He's probably very, very skilled in something that might be quite niche. It might be quite dated. And he probably doesn't really meet any live users of the live environment. Um, probably he certainly wouldn't release any code there. And in terms of openness to change, change isn't something he experiences at work or in his environment. Things don't change. And he's probably quite fearful of change. It'd be quite threatening to his environment. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll come back to that hold that thought the next cat is princess princess knows something that peanut doesn't princess knows that the outside is real because she's been there she's seen it she's smelt it she's met other people now in that environment empowerment 
princess knows what decisions are being made. She sees them being made for her. That, that while she goes outside, she's on a leash. Where she goes is directed by the person holding that leash. So in a work environment as an engineer, she can see what decisions are being made for her, but she can't influence them. And so actually out of our five cats, Princess is our most frustrated cat because she can see that there are other options, but she doesn't know how to access them. So, uh, uh, Princess is probably learning other skills. Skills will be broader, but the breadth of those skills will be limited to whatever's being used in her team. So it's still within her control. Um, uh, skills may be changing, maybe there's a move to go to React as the next framework, maybe everyone's, everyone's moving to AWS. A chance to grow as things move forward, but a control over what those things are that she's growing in and learning is where the limits are. She has been to the live environment, she's probably done some demos, thinking about the engineer at this point. She's probably demoed things to end users. Um, she's, uh, she wouldn't release things there still heavily reliant on an operations team, a supports team. If, think, if there were to be any live issues, they would take a long time to resolve because she wouldn't have the skills and experience to deal with that. So things would be going over, you know, over the wall to someone else to deal with. And in terms of openness to change, Princess is actually really keen on change. She'd quite like things to change, but she doesn't know how to make that happen. So she may come to conferences she may go to conferences online, they may see things that could be different, but wouldn't know how to instigate that in her environment. Next is Willow. Now, Willow is allowed out into the garden and she's very, very happy there. It's very comfortable. She can bathe in the sun. She can smell all the smells. She can chase butterflies, but she doesn't have to leave. She doesn't, all the scary stuff on the other side of the wall, outside that garden, she doesn't go out to that, she doesn't need to, she doesn't need to worry about any of those things. She's very safe in her garden, but she gets the pleasure of being out in that, in that, in that world. <clears throat> so perhaps this is an organisation where she works, where they've done their first agile transformation. They're all Spotify'd up. They've got their agile teams, they've got the scrum processes, protect the team from any external influences. They've got those processes in place. And at that point, because they've got that, they feel their transformation is complete. We've done it, we're there. And maybe life can get a little bit comfortable because entropy can kick in if you don't continue to change and improve things. So in this environment, as an engineer, in terms of empowerment, The engineers are quite protected from external pressures by those processes. They can work at a sustainable pace. They can collaborate on the things that they're trying to do. This is all really good stuff. Um, they've probably got their definitions have done all sorted out. Um, and things are probably really well documented. And that's all good. That's good stuff. But having made the leap into my child, and learned a lot about XP and lots, and lots of good engineering practices. Where their skills go next is, go again, is, is going to be slightly limited depending on what skills and what tools are needed in their team. Someone else's decision probably has determined what it is that they're going to go in their team. So the opportunities to reach out or to, to grow maybe are slightly limited. They, um, in their sprint reviews, they're demoing to to customers, they're probably starting to learn to want their product to succeed because they're demoing things to real people. They're getting feedback. So this idea of be building something that's got value, that's going to make people smile, that's going to be a really good product and maybe resilient and sustainable. And those things that actually come with wanting to support things, maybe that appetite or that need might start to be felt. They might start to care about making things that are actually good but they're still quite scared of the idea of supporting their life systems because in that garden is quite secure and quite safe. And in terms of openness to change, because they think they've done it, they've got agile sorted, they've done this transformation, they maybe at the moment don't feel any will to change further. 
So they might be starting to feel this connection with customers and starting to learn some new technologies, but as long as their, their environment isn't threatened, then they're still in a good place. So then we have my cat. So this is Squiggle, the free range cat. And Squiggle has been allowed outside for about a year now. I moved somewhere that is in the countryside, so it's relatively safe and he can go outside and he is very curious, very adventurous, um, and everyone knows him. And the whole neighborhood knows him and he has met some quite scary dogs. He's come back with a fluffed up tail, but I know it's okay. He's met something that's a bit risky, but he's come back, he's, he's dealt with it and he's fine. Um, so, and he checks in regularly. So I know he's earning that trust of being able to go, able to go outside because he keeps in touch. He doesn't stay away for too long. Um, and he uses his cat flap to come back in so I can let him out, but he knows how to come back in. That was the first thing that I taught him. So coming back to safety is something he can do. So I was very scared of letting him out, but he's earning that trust every day. So in engineering terms, Squiggle is an engineer in an autonomous team. They can make their own decisions. He's there to make his own decisions. He can go through, and, but he demonstrates through his behavior every day that he's worthy of the trust that that team gets because of the regular check-ins. This environment is one where engineers are trusted to make their own decisions. It's, it's a full build it, you run it environment where, um, <coughs> which requires that they have the freedom to choose the right things, but they need to have it made so that um, those it's easy to make the right decisions. So we start talking about some of those enabling constraints maybe that Liz talked about if you were in the first one. So <coughs> they can choose how to support the build, the thing, and the thing that they build and run, so they need the right to make those decisions. And the freedom though comes with the great responsibility um, to support um, those things as of each decision they make. So those different learnings, all those risks, they can be quite overwhelming as he's learning new things, facing new things all the time. In terms of skills, um, there's a whole load of new tech flying around. In a team like this, if you're free to make your own decisions, you have to learn a lot. You maybe think you need to learn the entire internet of everything. I used to be a developer, I couldn't now. It's far too complex for me. There are so many new things going around. He's kept on his toes all the new options that you're learning. If you're going to make a decision, you need to know those different things. In terms of interaction with the outside world, these teams are, and these engineers, they're releasing code regularly to the live environment. It's going out there, they're supporting it. Um, and so, and they're getting regular feedback. So um, in that environment, taking the, the cat flap bit, it's safe to fail when you release code because in his environment, he's set back some ways of rolling back that release or turning off that canary or the flag or whatever mechanisms he's got. They've developed ways to make it safe to go out and meet something scary or for something to happen and they can recover. So this autonomy and a connection with the end result creates an, an appetite to experiment. If we can push this, if we can just step that little bit further, what might happen? And this set of engineers are so used to change. Change is normal, it happens all the time. And in fact, it's potentially quite overwhelming. And so the thing there is, um, is, is, it, is it too tiring? There's, there's potential that they're very, very open to change. Uh, they need the, that openness to change to be there. But the thing to be mindful of is, are things changing too much for them? Because it's, it's a lot to try and keep up with. So finally, here's Rocky. Now, Rocky is the big toughy. He's a toughy of the street. He's absolutely beautiful. He's gr he's, he, he grows and defends his territory um, uh, by ambushing any other cat that gets in his path and trespassing beyond whatever boundaries might have been there. Um, he's strong and he's confident and he's as beautiful as any of the other cats that are up there and we adore him, but he is also a bit of a menace. And in engineering terms, he makes the environment full of risk. <laughs> so if we th he would be very happy in a Kinevin chaos world. He doesn't need any constraints, thank you very much. Um, he knows what he's doing. Um, and in terms of team playing skills, you could think of him as a 10x developer. He's, 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 he's quite exciting, but also a bit of a risk. So we're thinking think of him as a cautionary tale, and we think about autonomy and so on. 
So which challenges should we try and focus on? Which cats do you relate to or which cats do you see in your teams? And what can we do? Because this is not about trying to um, criticise any of our engineers. It's about the environment and what that can do for the, for the possibilities that they've got. So what can we change to enable them to, to be the best that they can? So if I, I would love it if everyone could be squiggle and be in a fully autonomous team. But it takes some work. So we're not going to, uh, you said you knew some peanuts. I, I'm hoping we don't know too many peanuts now. I think most companies have at least started their agile journey. So the, the idea that change is possible, new skills are possible, that there are the f other futures to try and, uh, try and reach for. Um, I'm hoping that those are there. So I'm not going to spend too much time talking about peanut, but I'm going to thank him for the learning. Um, and we're going to move on to talk about Princess. So if you have engineers like Princess in your organisation, um, they might be feeling restless. They might be itching for change. Um, and the key is to be heard for these engineers because they want change. They can see possibility. The biggest thing you can do for them is to listen and to give them a voice and to make them feel as if the organisation wants to hear what they've got to say and is open to change as they are. So what can we do there? So a great first step for this would be an internal tech, internal tech conference. Um, in this scenario, what you're doing is literally inviting anybody to, uh, to raise their hand and, and share a voice and, and say what's on their mind. So by in doing so, you're giving them a platform where they can challenge the status quo, bring some new insight or some ideas. And in doing that, you could be creating a, the beginning of a bit of a, a feeling of democracy where maybe everyone has voice sh can be heard. Another way is hackathons, just to broaden the horizons, to enable people, en enable people in different teams to start experimenting with things. So um, these high adrenaline events can be really good ways of engaging with um, users and enable the your engineers to hear from people who are not just um, the translators, the business analysts or the product owners, they can maybe hear from actual users and customers if it's internal things and people in your other departments can hear directly from your engineers and hear that they're smart and articulate when maybe you know, stereotypes may still stand and by opening that conversation in this setting it creates a possibility for more open conversation after that. So that can be another good starting point for conversation. Um, now, a sociologist called Ron Westrom, he talked about the benefits of a, a generative culture where information flows freely up and down the chain. But we actually want information to flow more than up and down. We want it to go left and right and in any direction that it can possibly go. So we're looking to open, up a, a, open those communication channels so that um, Princess can start to have influence, start to be heard, start to share some of those ideas so that they don't feel restless and, and itchy footed. Now, Willow, Willow, we t I, I sort of mentioned, might be a little bit comfortable. So in order to help Willow, we need to help her find the will as well as a way out of that garden. So once, two point, once culture 2.0 is in place, they set up Spotify, the walls have been put around the team. Those walls, which are there to protect them, can start to feel like boundaries. Um, and when you've got those boundaries, then you can end up with what Seligman, Seligman called a feeling of helpless, learned helplessness. This, I, we're, we're within this environment, um, we can't change things. Maybe there's blockers come up all the time, dependencies come up all the time, those things, we can't change those. There's no point in really trying. We need to inspire Willow to realise that thing change is possible. Um, so we need to remove some of those blockers, remove some of those assumptions of blockers. So the first thing to address is the boundaries and organisational constraints that are maybe there, which are reinforcing some of those blockers. 
So thinking about stream aligned teams and coming to team topologies now, Matthew Skelton's other book that sold better than the one we did. Um, <laughs> so stream aligned teams is where you've got everyone you need to be able to deliver the value that you're trying to do. It might be the people you know, in the marketing department, or editorial department, your FT, whoever. You've got all of the experience, all of the passion, all of the skills that you need to make decisions and act on them and deliver what you need to. And being surrounded by that passion, that interest, that, that knowledge and decision-making capability means that a momentum can be gained and you can, they can feel empowered and realise that they can actually achieve things by breaking down those walls. The next thing to do might again be those internal tech conferences, but this time what you're trying to achieve with them is an openness to change. So by seeing what other teams are doing, hearing other people's ideas, seeing that, oh, they've tried this, that sounds cool, I could try that, maybe we could do that, or they tried this and it didn't work, but we're so glad they told us because we can learn from what they did and, and creating a, a courage and a, a safety to fail. Um, it might just open up their mind and, and, and enable people to start thinking about being brave and, and trying different things and wanting to change some things. And it can also surface um, for debate some of those department-wide constraints. So if there is something about the way that, 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 that the delivery pipeline is, the way dependencies are managed, the way testing is done, the way monitoring, any of these things, if they're department-wide issues, they can come here and be discussed and they can be sparked and maybe you can get some working groups coming. So it's other ways to try and break down some of those barriers and boundaries that are there. Um, Nick Tune, um, in on um, his Twitter feed, can be worth checking out for some things in this area. Now, on to Squiggle. Squiggle might look like he has the high life, he's got the good life, he can, he's part of a team, they can make decisions, they can do, they can, they can, you know, they're fully empowered and autonomous and it is all, all is great, but it's a roller coaster of risk. And uh, the more decisions that they made, the more new stuff that they take on, the, the greater that cognitive load um, that can start to become quite heavy. And... Um, so we need, to, we need to help Squiggle cope with the overwhelm, potentially, of the great outdoors. So in terms of your engineering teams, consider setting up some enabling teams, or at least some of the practices that they would encourage or that they would support. So, for example, guardrails, enabling constraints, um, as per Liz's talk, you know, things that would help people make the right decisions. So we're equipping them, not kind of saying, thou shalt do this, but here are some good practices, these are some supportive practices. Um, <clears throat> this is how you can make a decision quickly and easily, just by going, what would that person say, without having to go to the trouble of approval boards and so on with them. Tech radar, maybe, defining some boundaries of, you know, what, again, it's just another way of expressing those guardrails, but more specific to technologies. These are the ones that we encourage, these are the ones that we don't maybe a golden path, maybe your enabling teams are helping to not just create this tech radar, radar and say those are the ones, but actually maybe they'll create some tooling to make it easier to use those things. So they may not carve out the specific platform into production, but they might decide to carve up, uh, pave some stepping stones along the way to make it really easy for people to do their things and unblock people. Daniel Bryant really good stuff on Twitter. He tends to write really good batches of tweets on a certain topic, and he does a lot around platform teams and enabling teams. And finally, an internal tech conference again. Um, in this instance, what we're trying to do is learning and sharing. So people can't learn the entire internet, they, they, but they, so they need to know who's really good at this stuff. How can they learn from each other? How can they all, how can um, one team's growth in, in knowledge actually help another team. So it's not just about your enabling teams, excuse me. <laughs> it's about creating a culture of generosity in your entire department. So can we encourage teams to create reusable components, reusable capabilities, shared capabilities, so they can optimise for the whole, so that when they're making stuff, they can make stuff that other people can use and they can demo it in these environments and they can all learn. So every talk, every demo, every workshop they do in there is a gift and start to encourage 
that sort of sharing. Good citizens. How do we get citizen delight? I don't know. Um, when it comes down to Rocky, um, I'm not sure Rocky thinks he needs anything from the department, but the department needs something from Rocky. They need him to, to learn how to be a team player. Um, they need him to, so we need to try and introduce things that reward community and collaboration and those sorts of things. So incentivize mentoring and buddying, incentivize training, those activities which will help the greater good. Incentivize sharing, anyone who gives their time to make someone else's life easier, reward that, encourage it, celebrate it. And again, the, the, the conference could be a tool for that, that culture of generosity I just mentioned. So to wrap up, I haven't seen my two minute notice, but I'm sure it's not far away. <laughs> I'm going to say, uh, reinforce that. We love all of these cats. We love all of the engineers that these cats represent. They are temporary labels just to um, express um, some concepts, but I would never try and say this person will always be a squiggle. The point is, what can we do to help people evolve into being the kind of engineers who will thrive in our environment? So it's about the environment and what we can do to help people. So if we have peanuts, how do we help them become willows, squiggles, and without going to become rocky? Um, so um, I have two requests. The first is to be generous. If you've learned stuff from here, please share it. Um, please share with me <laughs> any other ideas you've got, um, which is the second one. So share, share today's insights with me and with others. In the spirit of generosity, I would also just take this moment, I know that Jose has already said it, but the, uh, just going off topic a moment, the auction <laughs> upstairs. Um, I've bid on two of those things. I want someone to bid more than me. I'm open to a bidding war. They're both brilliant things that are worth far more than I've bid on them. One's for me, one's for, one's for a friend. Um, great causes, so be generous. And there we go, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>